I got that uh, Pastor Steve sternness. Good morning, good morning. Um, for those of you who are visiting, your first time, welcome. Uh, we're so happy you're here at Hope Chapel Koalao. Um I'm not Pastor Steve. Uh, he's my dad, but he's away with a few others uh, in the Philippines right now. Uh, so we've got to keep them in prayer, um, that they're safe, and that they just uh, are, God is going to use them in an amazing way up there. Um, we've been, Pastor Steve has been doing a series on discipleship. We're going to take a little break from that, and we're going to be in the book of John this morning, uh, John 14. Uh, so why don't we pray, and then we'll take a look at this passage this morning. Father God, we just thank you so much for who you are, Lord, and for your word. Thank you that it's alive and that it's uh, just fresh for us with every each new day. I pray that today um, we would just be able to get little bits of your knowledge, your wisdom out of this passage, Lord, out of your word, that we would leave here uh, better equipped to live more like you, Jesus. I pray in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, whew, worship this morning was, that was... I don't know, once in a, every once in a while, uh, I just, I just, as, as your worship leader, worship pastor, I just want to, uh, to edify or encourage all of you uh, that once in a while, there just gets that moment where you just let out an ugly cry uh, during, and it's like you don't want to do it, uh, but there's no controlling it. There's no, uh, you know, that's the Holy Spirit, you know, that's the Holy Spirit uh, moving in you, um, touching you. Um, if you ever get to have that experience, you know, first of all, we have to ask the Holy Spirit, allow Him to enter and to do His work. But when that actually happens, man, it's, it's, it's such an overwhelming, um, powerful experience to just be vulnerable and to be, um, just be real in God's presence. Not to hold back your worship to Him and just allow him to do the things that he wants to do in you. So if those kinds of things are happening within you, uh, if God is touching you in that way during worship, man, if it's coming up to the front and lifting your hands, and who cares if you look the fool, man? Look the fool for Jesus. Get down on your knees. If you need to if you start praying in tongues or whatever it is, just, if it's just ugly crying, man, um, allow God to move in and through you in that way. Uh, that's just my little bit of... That's the worship pastor side of me. Um, let's look through at John 14. We're going to go from verse 1 through 14. Um, let's all read it up on the screen together. You got it? Okay. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go... And prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Cue Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That, we, uh, that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, I, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, 
so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So the word of God. Amen? Amen. There's a lot there. I just want to preface this passage a little bit. So we're in the midst of what's called the upper room discourse. There are four major discourses or speeches, talks, long, uh, uh, prolonged talks that Jesus, um, of Jesus that are recorded in the Gospels. There's the Sermon on the Mount. We all know that one, hopefully. Uh, that's maybe his most famous. There is the, the kingdom discourse where Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven is like this, kingdom of God is like this, and there's the Olivet discourse. Jesus gives his sermon on the Mount of Olives, and this is the upper room discourse. And this is the first of those recorded discourses that is a private discourse. Okay, this is the Last Supper discourse where Jesus is alone with his disciples, his most intimate friends, his closest friends, his, his brothers, the men that were closest to him. He had already said everything he needed to say to the public, and they could either take it or reject it, right? Most of them rejected it, right? But he had nothing left to say. He had now time to focus on his disciples. And we start with this this first line that Jesus says. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Here we have the New International Version. I'll be also reading from the English Standard Version as well. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, at this point in the, by chapter 14, um, Jesus had already revealed a few things to the disciples to get them to be in this troubled state. Okay, for one, he let them know that he was going to die. All right? And if you think about how much Jesus meant to disciples, that can be very troubling for them, right? He was letting them know that he was going to give himself up, that his life was going to be taken, and that they wouldn't be, they would be with him no longer, right? And another thing is that um, Judas, right, one of them was going to betray him, right? Betray him for money, and that was later revealed to be Judas. Um, so that was also troubling. Peter was maybe the most troubled because Jesus reveals to him, you know, G- Peter says, you know, Lord, if there's anyone who's going to stand up for you, it's going to be me. If there's anyone who's going to go down fighting to the end for you, it's going to be me. And Jesus says, well, guess what, Peter? On this very night, you're going to deny me three times. So their world is all shaken up, right? Everything that they've, the past three years, they, I mean, think about it. They left everything for Jesus, right? To follow him, they trusted him with everything, and now there's this, this thought, this reality setting in that he's not gonna be with them for much longer, and that things are going to start unraveling in, in ways that they don't want. How, <laughs> how often in our life does, do things get stressed out like that? That's my first point this morning is, quit stressing, okay? Quit stressing. It's important to understand that do not let your hearts be troubled. This is not a suggestion. This is not a request. This is a command. This is a command by Jesus to his disciples. How how often have you heard, all throughout uh, growing up in uh, children's church, Sunday school, you know, junior high, high school, I always heard, you know, at Kohlau Baptist Academy, God will never give you more than you can handle, right? God will never give you something that you can't do. And in this case, do not let your hearts be troubled. That's true, right? Jesus is letting his disciples know and letting us know that we are in control of our emotions, right? How many of us oftentimes get angry? I get angry. How many of us get frustrated? How many of us get... Uh, depressed. We are in control of how we allow our emotions to control us. Jesus is saying to these disciples, I know you're upset. I know you're frustrated. They were, they were probably visibly agitated. And, you know, you, know you, you could see it in their face that he was recognizing 
Look, I get it. I get it. You're starting to stress out. You're troubled. You're frustrated. Stop. Don't do that. Right? It's time to put an end to that. Because you believe in God. So believe also in me. Right? You believe in God, so believe also in me. Let not your hearts be troubled. This should be something that, man, it's not an easy pill to swallow for us, but when life gets rough, when the struggles start to, to roll in and the, re- the realities of how life really is, just like for these disciples, start unraveling, man, do, do we let our emotions get the best of us? Do we let our, allow our heart to be troubled or do we trust God and, and who he is? And where he's brought us. This is why not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't stop believing. That's our sec to quote journey, okay? Um, don't stop believing. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm Jesus, right? Was, has there, think about what all the disciples had been through with Jesus up until this point. Was there anything left Jesus had to prove, right, that he was who he said he was, that he was God, right? The disciples were there when Jesus fed the 5,000, right? And the disciples were there when he raised Lazarus from the dead, and he was, they were there when he turned the water into wine, and when he walked on water in the storm and, and calmed the storm right in front of them. I mean... How can, how can they not trust this guy? How can they allow their hearts to be troubled in, in the presence of God himself when he's right there saying, you don't got to stress out? Jesus, I mean, for each of us too, I mean, if we think about all of the eyewitness accounts that have been recorded through, by so many people throughout this time period, it's, it'd be harder to prove uh, that Jesus didn't exist or wasn't who he said he was then if we just take him for his word and that he's, he is who he says he is. We can believe in him, right? Because he said, he said to he, he said, believe in God, believe also in me. So, verse two, in my father's house, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be, and you know the way where I'm going. So Jesus here is talking about heaven, right? He's talking about heaven, my Father's house. In, uh, we think back to maybe the times of Abraham and Moses, Isaac, Jacob. What did everyone live in back then? So I, 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 I talk to high schoolers all the time. So I, I'm like always looking for like vocal uh, answers. And so I'm going to treat this like a Youth for Christ club right now. Um, what did everyone live in back then? Yeah, they lived in tents, right? And there was always... Uh, the main frame tent, right, where the patriarch lived. It was always at the center. And whenever a son or a daughter got married and there was new additions to the family, they would just add a room, a new tent frame that would just, there would just be this big kaleidoscope of extended tents. And that's a little bit of what we're trying to get a picture of what our father's house looks like. That there's many rooms. Whenever you hear that word many in the Bible, that's what it means. It means a lot, right? It means that there's much room for all of us, right? That this, this Father's house, there are accommodations for everyone. Everyone who is willing to believe. Amen. I was looking into it and in some, uh, in some um, versions of the Bible, in some translations, you might read that it says, my Father's house there are many mansions, right? Or my father's house is like a mansion. But the more literal translation is like rooms, which we're reading here. And if we go even deeper, if we put that translation into that time period, it's more like apartments, okay? And that might sound a little disappointing compared to mansions, because I'm sure for most of us, think about heaven as this 
big golden gate with a white shiny pearly castle and a golden road and it's you know it's blinding right but it's it sounds a little bit more humble here in realms but i promise you it's going to be awesome our father's house is amazing god's room or god's apartment over satan's mansion any day amen, amen. so in looking a little bit into this in revelation john uh, John wrote Revelation as well. There's also this book that we're reading from. John has a vision of the new Jerusalem, right, coming out of heaven. And in this vision, there's, a, there's an angel who shares with him the dimensions of this, this new home that God is preparing for us, that Jesus is preparing for us. And I don't, I don't mean to lose us a little bit here, but this is just a little bit of the, the size and the scope of what Jesus is preparing for us, Okay. It says, don't let your hearts be troubled because there's hope. There's hope. Heaven is in your future. Okay? Don't stress out too much. This is what I got planned for you. The angel tells him that this home will be 12,000 furlongs in all directions. And what that basically means is it's 1,500 miles cubed. And I did the math, and that means 3,375 million miles in each direction. Okay? That's pretty big. That's pretty good. Okay? And I'm sure it's even bigger than that. Right? I'm sure it's even bigger than that. Or if we want to uh, compare it to somewhere here on earth, 15,000 times the city of London. Or roughly the size of our own moon. Okay, roughly the size of our own moon. So, if we, there was a, um, a man named Henry Morris who studied this and, and took all the dimensions of this new heaven, that, that this new earth that God is preparing for us, and how many people can this place accommodate? Well, if you just took 25% of that whole space, whole space just for a living area, right? Just for people to stay, 20 billion people. 20 billion. And each of those people would have 75 acres in each direction, right? Living space for their own self. That sounds pretty awesome, right? That sounds pretty cool. There's a lot of room in heaven. It's a big place. There's many rooms in our Father's house. Man, if you think about this, say, um, uh, my wife, right? She, she is the one who goes to work every day. Not that I don't go to work, but I'm at home most of the day with the baby. She goes, she's the one who goes to a regular job, seven to three. And I, I go to high schools uh, for a couple hours every day to speak to the high schoolers. So I'm at home, so I'm kind of like the housekeeper, right? And I want to make sure that the house looks nice for her when she go, gets home. That when she comes home and walks through that door, the first thing she says is, wow, this place looks awesome, right? And so I only have a few short hours to prepare the place, to get all the dishes done, to make sure there's laundry going, that the living room is clean, that all of the baby's toys are put away, all this stuff. I don't have a lot of time to prepare because that kid takes a lot of attention, right? If I only have this small amount of time to get my, our little studio home ready, Think about this. Jesus has been gone for over 2,000 years, right? He's been preparing this whole time, right? Let not your hearts be troubled. The place that Jesus is preparing for us is amazing, right? Let's put our hope in that. There's no, there's no um, struggle. There's no, um, you, know, you know, word of a new reality, a new circumstance that falls into our lap that, it should stress us out any more than the joy and the expectation of being in heaven, heaven being in paradise, being in eternity with Jesus should, should uh, be more than. Amen? Amen? We have a hope in heaven in Jesus Christ. And the fourth point I want to I uh, bring up is that, that Jesus is the way to get there. That Jesus is the way to get there. I love Thomas. I love you, father-in-law. 
We all know the character of Thomas from the Bible. He's often known as Doubting, Doubting Thomas. But I love Thomas because uh, I, I took a, a zoology class at uh, Windward Community College and my professor was a genius. He often was spitting out terminology that he assumed that we were all familiar with and I literally had no clue what he was saying, so sometimes for like 45 minutes at a time. But no one would say anything. I would also assume that everyone else just understood what he was talking about too. But here's Thomas, right? And he has no clue what Jesus is talking about. Like, where, where are you going? What's happening? See, Thomas has the, the wherewithal to just say it, to just say what's on his mind. Like, Jesus, I don't get it. I have no clue what you're talking about, but uh, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And this next statement is the gospel in a nutshell. What Jesus is about to say is the whole reason why he came. He says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one gets to heaven. No one gets to see these 75,000 acres you know, in each direction, you know, these 300 billion miles. No one gets to see this paradise except believe, through believing in me. I am the way. Right? Jesus has paved, uh, through his time on earth, he's paved this, this road for us, this model for which to follow and, and how to live, how to be generous and how to be forgiving, how to be compassionate, and when's a good time to get angry, and uh, how we should uh, love one another, how we should be kind to one another. These are all the things that he had been sharing uh, with the disciples. And he says it later on, you've spent all this time with me, right? You've spent all this time with me and you still haven't figured it out, right? Through all the miracles, through calling you out from that crappy situation you were catching fish, right? And transforming your life and still you're, you're doubting that I'm God, that you can believe in me, right? Man, I don't want that to be us, that we go through all this life and not truly trusting Jesus the way that we should, believing in him the way that he's calling us to. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's all about Jesus, everyone. Amen. It's all about Jesus. Quit stressing. There's, there's nothing too big for God. You know, you might be going through something that you've never gone through before. It might be someone in, that's close to you who is sick. It might be trouble at work. It might be a financial crisis, but God hasn't seen it before. There's no need to stress out. Because later on in this passage, he reminds us that he is sending another comforter. He is sending the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be our guide and to speak to us and to bring us peace. The Holy Spirit is with us. There's no need to stress. Don't stop believing in God and who he is and all that he's done, right? How, okay, just, just think about all the things that Jesus has done in your life. All the impossibilities that he's pulled through, the miracles that he's, he's made happen. Let's keep continuing to believe in him. Amen? Amen. Put our hope in heaven. This, is, this, isn't, this isn't our final destination. This isn't where it ends, right? We've got something really good that Jesus has been working really long and hard on preparing for us. Heaven is going to be amazing, guys. It's going to be so awesome. If we just, I mean, I just think about these Koala Mountains and just, you know, just staring at them and gazing at them and just saying, man, God, you're so creative. You're just so beautiful. Your creation is just so fascinating, you know. If he could pull that out for tiny little earth in the middle of this vast universe, woo, I, can't even, I can't even wait for what we're going to see in heaven. Hopefully we fly too. That would be awesome. <laughs> but just to remember as well, there's no getting there without Jesus. Unless we put our full faith and trust in who the person of Jesus Christ was, his life, 
and his death and his resurrection, it's, it's not going to happen. It's all for nothing. We have to put our whole trust and belief in, in Jesus and surrender our life to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. And there's so much more, Lord, that we could just kind of pull out of these words. But Lord, I just love the simplicity of your promise to us, Lord, that, that you're, uh, you're stern yet uh, compassionate towards us at the same time, to telling us to not let our hearts be troubled. Don't stress out. Don't get frustrated. Don't allow the world to... Uh, overcome you because he is you have overcome the world Jesus and all we have to do is continue believing in you knowing that you have prepared a place for us when all of this is said and done and that you Jesus are the way all we have to do is trust you you are the truth that we uh, live our lives upon Lord that your life Lord was lived as an example for us and how to, how to treat one another here on this earth and how to love one another. We just thank you so much, Father. I just want to allow this moment, if you could keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. There's anyone in this room who has yet to accept Jesus as their Savior, who wants that hope of heaven, that hope of eternity with the Lord for you, I just want to let you know that that's, that's available for you today. I want to just open the opportunity right now for you to say a prayer and accept Jesus into your heart to be your Savior. If no one else is looking, but if that's you this morning, why don't you just lift your hand and we'll pray together. You no longer have to live in the shame and regret of your old life have new life in Jesus Christ. All right, good. Sounds like we're all going. That's good news. Lord, we just thank you so much for all you do, all you've done, and all you're going to do, Father. Uh, we just um, are so humbled to have this family, Lord, this church family, to be able to call home uh, to fellowship with one another, to care for one another, just like you uh, take care of us, Lord. We thank you for this word, and we pray, Lord, that as we go out this week, that we would be able to apply it to our life and to share it with those who don't know you yet, Lord, to give them hope for their life as well. We love you and we praise you. pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.